What's up, y'all? It's Dr. Paul with another mail call for Liberty Hill Comics, where I share my passion and over 40 years' experience comic book collecting, investing, and conservation with you. This unboxing is another Golden Age All-Star Comics issue from my personal collection that I picked up from Lone Star Comics. This is a high-grade copy from the brief period the title was published without the DC Bullet logo and immediately after the resultant JSA membership change. It's been a while since I've been able to add an issue of All-Star to the collection, so I'm very excited to see it. As I fumble with this triple boxing from Lone Star, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thank you for joining me today. As a reminder, I'm currently running a free subscriber giveaway in appreciation of subscribers new and old. All you need to do for a chance to win this awesome slabbed first appearance of Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. and the first appearance of Hydra is be subscribed to the channel, follow the link over to that video, and leave a comment there. Good luck. We're closing in fast on that 800 subscriber target so we'll be doing that giveaway soon. Lone Star Comics, typical bomb-proof packaging here. As I said, triple boxed. Always takes me a moment to get into. Hopefully that hasn't put you to sleep. It only just helps build the anticipation for this beauty. Wow. Look at that, boys and girls. What a st Stunning comic book. Nearly 80 years old. Well, what is it and why do we care? This beauty is All-Star Comics number 26 in CGC 8.0 with off-white to white pages. It's the fall 1945 issue. The war was winding down and All-Star Comics was shifting from very patriotic themes to more sci-fi stories. And this book, written by Gardner Fox, is a perfect example of that shift. The cover art, featuring what appears to be a robot, is actually a metal-based life form from Jupiter by Joe Gallagher with an assist from Martin Nadell. More on that a little later. Interior pencils are by Joe Gallagher, Joe Kubert, Stan Ash, and Martin Nadell. In case you don't know why so many of us are obsessed with the JSA, they were the first superhero team in all of comic books. All-Star Comics featured the JSA for 11 years, from their first appearance in issue number three in 1940 until issue number 57 in March of 1951. And it has several big key issues. In addition to the first appearance of the JSA, including the first female superheroine in all of comics, which is Hawkgirl in issue number five, the first time Batman and Superman meet in issue number seven, the mega key, the first appearance of Wonder Woman in issue number eight, too bad she's not on the cover. It also includes first appearances of villains Brainwave, the Psycho Pirate, the Wizard, Per Degaton, and the Injustice Society, as well as one of only two Golden Age covers for Solomon Grundy. All-Star Comics is one of the most important and influential of Golden Age comic book series, and for good reason. It's my favorite Golden Age title, and one of my life goals is to complete the Golden Age run in mid to high grade. This issue is the last of only three issues that were published not with the DC logo on the cover, but with the All-American logo. The background as to why this was so does affect our story. You see, the company that we know today as DC Comics was, during the Golden Age, technically three companies that shared some common interests and cooperated in marketing and shared some characters. National was the original publisher of Action and Superman. Detective was the publisher of Detective Comics and the DC Bullet with its reference to Detective Comics and with the text around the bullock stating that it was a Superman publication was a way to show a united marketing front between the two companies. All-American Comics 
founded by M.C. Gaines, who would later found E.C. Comics, joined National and Detective as the third member of the cooperative. All-Star Comics, from issue one in 1940, had the DC Bullet logo and used several characters from National, including Sandman, the Spectre, and Dr. Fate, and later, Starman. However, in 1944, Max Gaines wanted to be bought out of All-American Comics, and Harry Donenfeld, who had consolidated control of DC and National and had just merged them, obliged him and then merged All-American into the surviving National by 1946. But while they were working out the details, which were quite contentious, All-American dropped the DC logo from the covers of comics and the National characters from the lineup of the Justice Society. So the JSA lineup for issue 26 here consisted exclusively of characters for the first time created under the All-American Aegis. These were the Chairman Hawkman, Secretary Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, Johnny Thunder, The Atom, The Flash, and Dr. Midnight. But the problem is that it takes months to produce, print, and distribute a comic book so the writer and the artist have to complete the work months in advance. Gardner Fox had originally scripted the story to include the Spectre and Starman, who had to be replaced with the Flash and Green Lantern in the finished comic because of the short-lived schism between National and All-American before they were merged. Martin Nadell was brought in to redraw the panels for these characters. The Flash stands much taller and broader in this issue than he normally did because the artwork had to cover up the imposing figure of the specter. And Green Lantern's hands are held at odd angles in all of the panels because his figure was originally holding the star rod aloft. In fact, in two panels you can still see the star rod in his hand. Knowing this history makes a walk through the story a bit more fun. The splash page by Joe Gallagher is a copy of the cover art, but with the art from the JSA team members flipped left to right. The story proper opens with Hawkman calling the meeting after bemoaning the fact his invited guest, Hebert Crawford, doesn't show. He tells the team he was hoping they could hear it directly from Crawford, but in his absence relays Crawford's data of an object hurtling toward Earth that he believes portends an invasion. Hawkman reveals that spectroscopic analysis determined the object is a spaceship containing only metal. Crawford's theory, relayed by Hawkman to the JSA, is that it contains metal-based life forms from the planet Jupiter. He theorized that the metal men will be small, at only about four inches tall but that both they and their spacecraft will pose a threat to Earth as they will likely absorb metals by imbibation. Just then, Johnny Thunder overhears on the radio several strange phenomena all related to metal and the team decides to take action. Joe Kubert handles the art chores on the Hawkman chapter in which Hawkman travels to Silverland City. There, the Jovian invaders have discovered the delights of the warm sun and are absorbing the town's silver deposits, the practice of which causes them to grow and take on the physical and chemical properties of the silver they have been imbibing. The townsfolk are ill-equipped to deal with them, and in truth, so is Hawkman. After failing to stop them by physical means, he notices they are stealing the mine's payroll, which consists of paper money, which perplexes him. He decides he needs another approach. Then occurs a physical altercation with the police to stop them interfering, after which, their eyes blackened by Hawkman's fists, they thank him for saving their lives and pledge their assistance. I can't make this stuff up, boys and girls. After a quick stop to get change for a dollar, 
Hawkman hurdles 100 pennies at the Jovians, who had entered a dynamo and had become charged with electricity. The pennies short-circuit them and they die. Their metal bodies fuse together. Hawkman reports back to the team his findings, including the odd stealing of the payroll. The Atom encounters the Jovians in the subway station, where they are absorbing the tracks and creating mayhem. The Atom is likewise no match for them physically, but also notices them entering a nearby jewelry store to rob it. He uses his knowledge of chemistry and the assistance of the local authorities to accelerate the Jovians' rusting now that they consisted almost entirely of iron, and they die by oxidation and turn to rust. The Green Lanterns chapter has the Joe Gallagher art that has been touched up by Martin Nadell to replace Starman with the Green Lantern. Because of this, Green Lantern's arms are held in odd poses in every panel, making the art appear stiff and awkward. Here, the Jovians invade a magnesium plant and start absorbing the magnesium. Green Lantern saves a magnesium plant worker from the rampaging invaders, and it is on this page that we see in panels 1 and 3, the star rod was missed in the art touch-ups. Again, no physical attacks from Green Lantern affect the Jovians, but he realizes, once they have imbibed all of the magnesium, that their bodies are now highly inflammable. He isolates them away from the factory before using his ring to ignite them, and they go up in flames. Dr. Midnight's chapter takes him to Smithville, in which the invaders from Jupiter are consuming all of the copper, taking out communications across the area, including both the new telephone system as well as the telegraph system, causing widespread panic among the populace. Again, the invaders toss our hero aside quite easily, and again, they are seen inexplicably robbing paper money. Dr. Midnight employed the help of locals and led the Jovians away to distract them while the townspeople disguised a pile of lead as copper. Upon returning, the Jovians consumed the disguised lead and died of lead poisoning. The Flash's chapter takes us to the Metropolis Museum and we see more of Martin Nadell's touch-ups, this time redrawing and or pasting the flash over the specter. The Jovians here are absorbing gold and stealing art, and because they took on both the chemical and physical properties of the metal they are imbibing, the flash is able to defeat them due to the great malleability of elemental gold. Next, we follow Johnny Thunder to Alaska, after some rather regrettable representations of indigenous peoples, Johnny encounters the Jovian's spacecraft. He inadvertently frees the spacecraft from its landing site, and it begins to absorb the materials around it and grow as the Jovians themselves do. He summons his thunderbolt to summon the other JSA members, and they use vats of nitric acid to oxidize the spaceship and turn it into a pile of nitrate which neutralizes its ability to consume everything around it. Upon returning to JSA headquarters, the team encounters Hebert Crawford himself, who has decided with his new gifts he can single-handedly destroy the Justice Society. He reveals that it was he that convinced the Jovians to invade Earth, and that they were stealing for him. Although Crawford has somehow gained the powers of all of the metals that the Jovians were imbibing, he also inherited all of their weaknesses. The team set about defeating him by repeating their chemical tricks that had worked on the Jovians. Defeated and dejected, he admitted that the Jovians meant no harm and were merely hungry. Sick of being derided for his theories, he took advantage of the Jovians to enrich himself. The JSA pledged to help him set up a lab and use his scientific genius to help mankind, once he pays his debt to society in jail, of course. There are 63 universal copies of All-Star Comics number 26 in the CGC census, with a median grade of 5.0. This copy, at 8.0, occupies the 19th percentile, with only 8 graded higher. 
It's very difficult to place a true fair market value on these comics because, being rare, they trade hands rather infrequently. Go Collect notes only two CGC-graded sales of All-Star Comics number 54 in the past 12 months. In November of last year, an 8.0 with cream to off-white pages sold for $1,440 plus shipping and taxes at a heritage auction. I paid $1,500 plus shipping and taxes for this book from Lone Star Comics, which I think is a fair price given the upgraded paper quality from the copy that sold last year for $60 less. This book is for my personal All-Star collection, and I'm not looking to sell it anytime soon, but I still want to be very well bought on my collection because getting a good deal on a super rare Golden Age book is a big part of the fun for me. As I've discussed before, you typically need to pay market prices to acquire books of this sort of high-grade Golden Age caliber. If I were trying to bargain hunt these books, it's just not realistic to believe I could complete a full run of All-Star in my lifetime. With that in mind, I'm really thrilled to add another high-grade copy of All-Star Comics to my collection. I hope you enjoyed this video on this Golden Age All-Star comic featuring the JSA. By adding this beauty to my collection, I'm one step closer toward my goal of completing the original run. I think it's time to do a show-off video in which I put all my All-Star comics together, so look for that in the near future. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Let me know in the comments below what your collecting goals are. Until next time, happy hunting and take care of one another.